This week we're going to be talking about the first of our t-tests. We're going to try to just go ahead and review all of the t-tests. They're very related. Your assignment only covers the chapter 9 one sample t-test though. So we'll focus on that as far as the mathematics. But we're going to try to review t-tests conglomerately. Now there are really three types of t-tests. So when you think about t-tests, we already learned a one sample version of a test and this test was the z test and that's for one sample and that's when you're comparing one sample against an expected value um, so we originally learned it as the z score then we learned that there's this z test a z test is performed when you know the population variance or standard deviation here sigma or sigma squared so that value has to be known not known you can't perform a z test you have to do a t test and that's what we're going to talk about today so this is when sigma is unknown so you have to estimate it with a sample and you use a sample standard deviation right but there's also additional extensions of this t test so we're going to learn about the independent samples and the related samples t tests which are again cases where you're not going to know you're going to estimate but this is instead of one group against an expected value this is going to be two groups right so you're comparing two groups against one another and this is comparing people normally to themselves um, so we like to see if you are different at the beginning and the end of class but sometimes we use what's called matched samples in the related sample t-test so these are two different versions of it but so these are the three types of tests we're going to look at and i always say the universal test is really an observed against an expected value and it's hedging this whole thing over a standard error the expected chance difference which is measured again by a standard error and we learned that concept in chapter seven so we've got all of these things that we're talking about right now and we're looking at t-tests so the t-test was initially established by sir william Seeley gossett publishing under the name student he worked for guinness breweries they were trying to increase wheat production he developed tests to help them do this while working for them he had to publish under a pseudonym the name student so this is sometimes called the studentized t-test because of Gossett's pseudonym. So sometimes it's called student's t-test. So the whole idea here is when you didn't have a population value, you had to estimate it. Now, some of the things about this that are worth noting though is unlike the Z distribution, the standard normal distribution and normal distribution, uh, which never changes its shape, right? The, the standard normal distribution was always this nice normal looking curve it never changed shape it was always the same this isn't the case with t t is approximately normal and it changes its shape as a function of degrees of freedom and degrees of freedom matter here again remember because degrees of freedom come into play when we are dealing with sample estimates instead of population values we learned that when we first handled them in chapter four because in chapter four, we learned that if you were dealing with a population variance, uh, you could just divide by n, but a sample was n minus one because of a loss of degree of freedom. So that same thing comes into play here where we're gonna have to know the degrees of freedom because the distribution, as you can see in this picture, changes its shape as a function of degrees of freedom. More specifically, if the degrees of freedom are infinite, then the distribution is exactly equal to a Z distribution. Because again, if you had infinite degrees of freedom, you know everything, you know the value of sigma. However, when you have fewer degrees of freedom, what happens? More values are in the tails and fewer values are in the center. Now what this does is it makes it harder to have a very rare value. Because remember, the quicker this line right the quicker this asymptote approaches the x-axis um, the space under here represents how frequent something occurs right here probability of x is on the y-axis so here where the black line converges on the x-axis faster these values are rare when they're still not considered statistically rare or 
significant at this point. And you see that the degrees of freedom is lowest for this orange curve, and it's the tail that stays farthest from the x-axis for the longest period of time, the longest distance from the mean, from zero. So this is a good thing because what it does is it means when you're going from fewer observations, you expect the differences to be greater if you want to make the inference that they are meaningful. I often use the analogy in real life, we do the same type of thing. You could imagine if you get promoted at a job, you're a manager, and your job as manager is to consider um, you know, employee punishment, people who are late, you have to keep track of those things. Well, if you have a new employee, and this new employee is a minute late the first day, it might be a little extreme to make the decision based on that one observation, right? Only one observation, very little data, and it's a very small effect, it's a minute. So it might be a little extreme to decide this person is a late person, right? To draw that large, broad inference about this person from a small effect that's only based on a single observation. Now, on the other hand, if you have this person coming late two hours for no good reason, even based on a small amount of data, it's probably reasonable to draw the inference that this person is a late person because that is a very large difference. So you basically, if you think about like time of lateness would be on the x-axis, right? How extreme is their lateness? And then how likely is that to occur? A minute is not a very extreme value, and so it's not going to be significant if you have small degrees of freedom, right? But if you're two hours late, that's such an extreme value. It's so far out um, that even on one observation, it's probably something we would consider significant. It's probably meaningful. And so we would stop and say, wait, this employee is probably not reliable. We might want to rethink this. Now, on the other hand, if that employee is one minute or five minutes late, but they are that way, every day for two months well then you probably can draw the inference that this person is a late person because now even though it's a small effect you have so much data right so many observations to go on that you can conclude that it's probably a real thing and statistical significance is really about whether or not the effect you're observing is a real thing or if it's kind of a fluke it's due to chance so if you have a small difference, but observed reliably over many observations, you can conclude it's probably real. This person is probably a tardy person. However, to conclude that it's a real effect and not just a chance thing or a fluke from a small amount of data, it has to be very large. And that is exactly what the T distribution is requiring here. The T distribution is saying, we're not gonna consider things extreme on small amounts of evidence unless they are very extreme, right? And so it's kind of a benefit that the t-distribution as Gossip designed it has this kind of adjustment as a function of the degrees of freedom, right? In a context where we don't have infinite sample size or we don't have a known variance. So the one sample t-test is what we're going to focus on today. And the one sample t-test is really very, very similar. If you remember the Z test, if we were computing a Z test, right, it is a sample mean minus the population mean over the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n, which is, of course, this term here is what? It is the standard error of the mean, right? That's the denominator here. So here on the numerator, you have the differences between the, the expected and observed value, right? The observed value here is the sample mean. The expected value is the population mean. And in the denominator, you have the standard error of the mean. Now, the one sample t-test is really the same thing. What's gonna change? Again, we don't know sigma. So you're gonna have a sample mean. You're gonna have an expected population value. And you're gonna have a sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. This is still a standard error of the mean, but this is now describing the sample instead of the population. So really it's the same thing, right? It, you're doing the same test, you're just applying it in a different context as a function of whether or not you know sigma, right? Do you know the population variability, variance or standard deviation? So we're really not doing anything super unique. 
This is very much what we did last week. We're comparing one sample against some expected value, and we're determining if it's significant by using the standard error to decide whether or not what we see is likely due to chance, right? So again, ignoring X, Y, doesn't matter. Your book, uh, again, your book likes to use APA notation, which a sample mean in APA notation, if you remember, is capital M. Um, in statistics, we often write X or Y bar, right? This is the stats notation for a sample, right? And then, of course, if you remember, mu is the stats notation for a population mean instead of for a sample mean, okay? Here we, again, can abbreviate standard error of the mean with the symbol. So this whole term, this is mathematically, this is how you would compute the standard error of the mean, right? And symbolically, how we represent that would be the standard error subscript mean. And this is telling you that this is the standard deviation that belongs to the means. Because remember, standard errors are the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. And in this case, we're talking about a sampling distribution, right, of the sample means, so the sample means are in here, not just scores. So the standard deviation is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean, which is computed based on the central limit theorem that way, right? So these things are all the same thing. If I write S divided by square root N, that's the standard error. If I write S subscript X bar, that's the standard error. If I write STM, standard error of the mean, all these things mean the same thing. And again, it goes back to the universal test, the universal test being the observed difference, the difference between the estimate, sample mean, and the parameter, the expected population value, over the standard error. Commonly, the expected value under the null hypothesis is going to be zero. But that's not always the case. If the value is not zero, it will be given to you in the problem. They'll say something like, imagine a teacher has a group of students and this teacher wants to know whether the students perform better on the SAT than the state average. The teacher knows the state average, but the teacher does not know the variability for the state SAT scores. So the teacher's class gets a score of 1120 on average. The teacher's class has 25 students. The teacher's class has a standard deviation of scores that is 25 points. And the population value in this case, the state average, is 1050. So here the teacher can't run a simple Z test because the teacher does not know the variability for the state. So the teacher does a one sample T test, which would be the observed value minus the expected value divided by the standard error of the estimate, which is standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So what we would get is 70 over 25 divided by 5 equals 70 over 5 equals 14. So we have a t-score of 14 on 24 because n minus 1 in this case because we have one estimate. The sample mean, right? So our df for a one sample test is n minus 1. We start with n, lose 1 for every estimate, right? And you can always see this by looking in the numerator for the number of estimates. This is the population value, not the estimate. So we're going to have 25 minus 1, 24 degrees of freedom. So we have T on 24 degrees of freedom, which is in parentheses in APA style, equals 14. And then we would look up the p-value with this, the same way we would do with Z's. And this is going to be a very small p-value, so I'm going to write less than 0 0.001. Because if we look this up using GraphPad, Excel, or in your book, you will find that that is going to be a very significant value. A very large t value and so here we would have a significant difference this difference then indicates what it indicates that the teachers students in fact are significantly outperforming expected value so they're doing better than the rest of the state 
So this is a good thing. And this is an example of a use of a one sample t-test.